Thanks, Jamie. Well, it's uh, nice to be here. It's nice to be inside. Uh, Sarah and I had a great field day, or we're part of a great field day up at Dort College yesterday. Um, but we were outside in a tent for three hours. Um, but, you know, I have to say, that really highlighted the interest in cover crops. Because we had 83 people there. Almost all of them stayed all three hours, despite the cold. Uh, when we left, there were still probably 15 people there talking. So I think it really, um, really kind of highlights how much interest there is out there and how, how uh, um, people need information. A lot of farmers uh, there and, and students there as well. So in your, I found that, that Jamie put this in your um, packet of material. Um, why don't you take that out because uh, I'll refer to that quite a bit. Many of you, um, likely the majority of you have heard about the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the science assessment. I'm not going to uh, go into, um, you're not going to have to listen to me that long, but I just wanted to highlight a few things. But if you go to the website there, you can find out um, a lot more information as well as watch some different presentations, uh, different slide sets uh, about the, primarily the science assessment, non-point source science assessment. So just to give you a, a quick background, um, for some of you, this is, you've had to hear this too many times already, but uh, the science team had folks from Iowa State University, um, Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship, the Iowa DNR, um, the ARS, uh, Dan James, Mark Tomer, and uh, John Kovar, and David James, uh, Eric Hurley from the NRCS was involved, and then um, some uh, folks from outside of Iowa, Mark David, Giles Randall, and Katie Flayhive. Um, the, the better part of this team, minus uh, Mark, Giles, and uh, Katie, met every two weeks for about 21, 22 months. Uh, Mark, Giles, and, and Katie uh, didn't participate on all of those uh, calls or all those meetings, but they provided a lot of uh, important information as we went through the process. Um, just to give you kind of a background, uh, the approach, we tried to establish the baseline conditions. That's very difficult, and I think that's one of the things that, that hopefully we can do in the future is track what practices are out there, um, what we're doing on the land so that we can make estimates of load reduction in the future. Um, did an ex extensive literature review to assess potential practice performance, and that's really what's summarized uh, in this table as we start looking at what practices uh, could be used to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus movement to, to downstream water bodies. These, these first um, two components were actually uh, sent out for blind peer review. Uh, nitrogen and phosphorus separately, uh, but uh, only, only Dr. John Lawrence uh, knows who the reviewers were of those. And, and the only thing he said is that it was not the same reviewers for both the nitrogen uh, and the phosphorus. Uh, so about, um, I think there were at least three uh, peer reviewers for each of those. Um, we then try, use that information to, to try to estimate potential load reductions of implementing these practices uh, and the cost of implementation uh, at the farm scale, farm scale cost. Okay, so as we start to think about nitrogen and phosphorus, and that's one of the things that, that I think is important as you start to look at both sides of this, this um, sheet, we start thinking about nitrogen the primary pathway for nitrogen to get to our streams is in the nitrate that's moving with the water through the, through the crop root zone and either to a tile line or to shallow groundwater. Whereas phosphorus, primarily, we're maybe most concerned about that surface water runoff. So a practice that reduces runoff but does nothing to change the concentration or, or volume of water moving through the, the plant root zone, is it going to do anything for nitrogen? Not really. I mean, if it helps for phosphorus, but it doesn't reduce nitrate concentration or water flow through the root zone, it's not going to do much there. So we'll kind of uh, I'll highlight that. So if we start looking at the nitrogen reduction practices, and you can, there's more detail on this sheet. So you can see all the practices that, that we looked at. Uh, so on nitrogen management, we have things like timing, source, application rate, uh, inhibitor, cover crops, and living mulches. And as we look at this sheet, uh, which one of our nitrogen management practices, or which couple, have the, show the greatest percent nitrate nitrogen reduction from our review of, of water quality research from Iowa, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota? 
So if we're going to work with farmers on reducing nitrate export from their fields, if you look at your sheet under nitrogen management, which, which couple practices might be, we really highlight? Cover crops, okay? So what's the goal, what's the load reduction goal for nitrate, or nitrate, nitrogen, excuse me, nitrogen and phosphorus to the Gulf of Mexico? 45%, okay? As we went through the Iowa science assessment, looking at point and non-point sources, the estimate was that uh, point sources might be able to reduce their nitrogen loading by about 4%, or 4% of the total, and phosphorus about um, 15, 16. So the non-point source load reductions needed are about 41% on nitrogen, 29 on phosphorus. So let's think about this nitrogen management again. If we look at all of these, because I often hear if farmers just apply the right amount of nitrogen at the right time, we'll have no nitrate problem. Does that look so if I apply the right timing, if I move from fall to spring, I get about a 6% reduction, right? Application rate, it's going to depend on my starting point, but if we use our statewide average and move it to the maximum return to nitrogen level by the core nitrogen rate calculator, on this sheet we get about a 10% reduction. Now those are not completely additive, and not all of our nitrogen is going down in the fall, so it's, it ends up, you know, it's not a 6% reduction just moving fall to spring if you did it on a statewide basis because only about 25% of the nitrogen goes down in the fall. So there's still some, I would say, some misconceptions out there that we could solve all of our problem with just better infield nitrogen management. It has to start there because if we can reduce our application rate, maintain crop yields, that's a win-win for the farmer, right? But we're going to have to start looking beyond that. And that's where, as we start thinking infield, to me, you know, my initial, you know, I'm an ag engineer, so you'd think I'd just go down to the engineered practices, but um, I'm learning from people like Tom that we should start looking at some of these other things. But we see cover crops about a 31% reduction. Now, we do need to recognize some of these other land use changes have great potential, but the economics may be a little bit more challenging with some of those. Um, and as we start to think about 40% reductions, we're likely going to need to combine those infield management with some land use or edge of field practices. So you can see here drainage water management and shallow drainage. So drainage design has potential to reduce nitrate export. Uh, wetlands, especially those that are um, strategically sited so they intercept tile drainage and, and intercept nitrate. So wetlands can be very effective for treating nitrate. But the thing is, they have to see the nitrate. And so we need to get that nitrate into them. Some of, you know, some uh, wetland restoration um, that doesn't see nitrate is, is reducing nitrate because you're taking land out of production. But if you don't have nitrate coming into it, you're not able to really uh, see some of the benefits that, see some of the, the big benefits that you'd want as far as overall load reduction. Uh, bioreactors, certainly another one. Who's, who's seen a subsurface drainage bioreactor? Okay, so almost all of you here. So as we start to think about some of these practices, um, we looked at on-farm cost, um, tried to estimate that. Didn't, our science assessment did not look at the, the uh, economic benefits from some of the, say, co-benefits that are provided by some of these practices. So let's think about a wetland and a bioreactor, for example. Okay, they both treat nitrate, about 40 to 50% reduction, okay? Are they the same in all, from all other, the other benefits they provide? No, what? Is a bioreactor really cool to look at? <laughs> Not really. I, I'm an engineer and I still don't think they're that cool to look at. Now, they perform a great function. They reduce nitrate. But if we're looking at wetlands and bioreactors, do wetlands provide other benefits? Yeah. What other benefits? Habitat. Habitat. Pretty aesthetic value. Maybe some flood potential. So there's all kinds of other benefits. So as, as uh, watershed groups go about thinking what practices they can implement, hopefully those are things that are considered as well. Okay, and then buffers are another one. Buffers can have great potential to reduce nitrate as long as that shallow root zone of the buffer sees the nitrate and it's not moving below it or through a tile line. So we have great 
potential for concentration reduction, but if you look at the, the science assessment, the potential load reduction for nitrate with buffers is fairly low just because it, the buffer doesn't see a lot of that water. Now, there are um, folks, Tom Eisenhart and Dan Janes, that are looking at resaturated buffers, where they're taking a tile line, putting a distribution uh, pipe on the leading edge of the buffer before that tile goes through it, and trying to promote shallow groundwater flow um, below that buffer to treat it. So I think there, there's potential there with some of those, those things. Okay, let's look at the, the phosphorus real quick. And uh, again, phosphorus management uh, has, has some potential. I think one of the biggest things, you know, reducing the tillage intensity out there is probably uh, first and foremost one of our, our, our goals to reduce phosphorus. But even in those areas where soils are high or very high in soil test P, we might be able to reduce phosphorus application rate, um, see a benefit in reducing phosphorus loss, and the farmer's not putting, um, having to pay for those inputs. Um, we look at land use change of, of perennial pasture or buffers, those also uh, great, great benefits. So I want you to take just a minute to look at nitrogen management and phosphorus management on this sheet. And uh, I want you to tell me what practice is in both places. I just, yeah, just look at, so we're thinking about the infield management the farmer does. And I want you to look at the phosphorus management practices and the nitrogen management practices. Tillage. Oh, okay, tillage. Do you see tillage and nitrogen management? It's a great, great uh, cover, crops. cover crops. Yeah, so okay, tillage. This has been brought up a lot. Um, and tillage has a lot of benefits. Uh, reduction in tillage has a lot of benefits. It helps us reduce surface runoff. Obviously, it helps us reduce phosphorus loss and soil erosion. But the research studies that we were able to review that look at no-till versus a more conventional tillage, even after 20 years at the Northeast Research Farm at Nashua, we see similar nitrate concentrations coming out of that tile line under a no-till compared to a conventional till. Now, one of the things you, you might see, uh, I know one phase of that study up there looked at it, and they saw a decrease in nitrate concentration where they had no-till, but they saw an increase in drain flow because they had more infiltration, so the load of nitrate coming out that tile line was the same between the no-till and the conventional till. Okay, so lots of benefits from that no-till system, but you know, for, for our systems in Iowa, we've not seen a benefit on the nitrate concentration coming out that tile line. Okay, but Aaron noted it. What's the one we see both places? Cover crops. We see, you know, pretty big benefit here on phosphorus and then nitrogen as well. So as we start working with, with farmers on their infield management, I think cover crops is going to have to be one of the major players if we want to reduce nutrients nutrient loading to downstream water bodies. Also, let's think about what are some of the other benefits of cover crops? Okay, erosion, that's how we're getting some of that phosphorus benefit. Weed suppression. Maybe, yeah, I think there's all, weed suppression, perhaps. Dr. Uh, I, or Hartzler is looking at that, right? right? Yeah, okay. Maybe some soil health benefits, some benefits to the soil system. Yep. So I think all of those are, are things that we need to also continue to document over time uh, because some of it has you know, maybe been more anecdotal than, than others, but we need to continue to document that over time um, because there, is a, there would be some cost to put in the cover crops. And so the more benefits that we can document for the farmer, hopefully the easier we are, it'll be to get that adopted. Okay. The, um, my last slide, I think, here just to to kind of highlight um, the need uh, for cover crops, but also the need for, for um, kind of the level of implementation needed to get to some of our goals. So these are just, these are e example scenarios that uh, the, the science team kind of um, played around with just to highlight kind of the, the overall scope of implementation that would be needed to get to those reduction goals of 40, 
41 and, and 29 after we take off the point source load reduction. So in this one, we NCS1, we reduced application rate, uh, which is about one, we averaged about 151 to corn following beans in Iowa. We moved it down to the MRTN of, uh, of about 133. On average, that was with $5 corn and 50 cent nitrogen, so a, a ratio of 0.1. Um, we've had some questions on that. You know, when, when we started this process in October of, what, 2010, when we started $5 corn and 50 cent nitrogen, nobody complained. When some people started looking at this last October, they said, well, you got to use $7 corn and 50 cent nitrogen. And I asked the question, so corn's going to always stay at $7, right? Well, we don't know that, but you know, we should use what the price is now. Well, you know, we can ask Chad Hart and Mike Duffy. I don't think their long-term projection is $7 corn. So I feel like $5 corn is not so bad. Okay, MRTN rate, 60% of the acres um, in Iowa have a cover crop. 27% uh, of all ag land is treated with a wetland and 60% of all drained land has a bioreactor. Those are pretty high levels of implementation, aren't they? Very high, yep. So I like what uh, Dr. John Lawrence says, you know what? He says, getting the reductions that we need, it's not impossible, but it's not simple either. You know, because how are we going to get those levels of, of implementation? All right, NCS3 was one we looked at MRTN. Uh, we put 95% uh, of, of all acres um, in a cover crop. 34% uh, of all ag land in 103 and 104, which MLRA 103 and 104 is uh, kind of the Des Moines lobe and then east of the Des Moines lobe. So kind of the, the heavily tile drain landscape where we could intercept those tile lines for wetlands. Uh, and then 5% of land retirement in all MLRAs. And you see 42 and 50. So we could get to those, but again, we're, you know, here we're saying essentially all of our acres, all of our corn, soybean, or continuous corn acres in Iowa have a cover crop. So pretty high level of, of implementation. And you can see some of, some of the costs. This NCS1 uh, had a, our estimated equal annualized cost of about three quarters of a billion dollars a year. Um, with a, if you just take out the initial investment of that, that's about $3.2 billion. We see the NCS3, 1.2 billion for the EAC, with an initial investment of about $1.2 billion. So why do you think the initial investment of this one is so much greater than, so NCS1 versus NCS3? Bioreactors. Wetlands and bioreactors, exactly. So what's the, uh, um, if we get wetlands and bioreactors, most of that cost is an upfront capital cost to get those structures in place, right? The annual maintenance cost is, there's not that much maintenance required with them, right? How about cover crops? How much initial investment does it require to, to get into cover crops? Not that much, but there is an annual cost, right? Yep. So that's, that's why we see such a, you know, with this NCS3, uh, we ended up having, you know, fewer wetlands in that case, and so that's why that initial investment uh, went down. Okay, I think I'll, um, I think other people will probably highlight some of, of the, the performance of, of cover crops. Yeah, Sarah. I just have a question. Yes. If you're with that reduction, if 95% of the landscape was in cover crops, think of the reductions in multiple crops. So how is, how is that split with the equation? Yeah, it, as I said, ours. The, what we were asked to do was to put together the farm level cost. But you're exactly right. The next step is to look at what, what are the costs to clean up the water? Or what are the economic benefits from having cleaner water? That's exactly right. And, and I think that, you know, but if a farmer is making the decision right now, you know, they're making the decision, you know, based on, you know, how much it costs to put in a cover crop and what they get for some of the benefit. Okay, but I think you're exactly right. In the future, we have to put a value on either cleaning up the water or the economic benefits of cleaner water. And then we need, you know, what are the barriers to adoption? If we want 60% of the acres in cover crops, what are the barriers to getting that, <laughs> getting that done? There's a lot more interest in controlled drainage 
after 2012. Uh, just because you know, holding the idea of holding back water uh, sounds very attractive. Now, um, the problem is you have to have water to hold back, which we really didn't last year. But if you're next to a stream, you have a flat field, you put in controlled drainage, you also have the potential to put water back into the system and sub-irrigate as well. So I think there are, you know, as we start to look at this, I think there we can, I like to sometimes, if I, if I put on my optimistic hat, instead of, my wife calls me pessimistic, I say I'm a realist, but if I put on my optimistic hat, I'd say let's look at these, where are there opportunities or economic opportunities for people to be involved, you know? Cover crops are, I think, a great example. You know, to get all these cover crops planted, to have cover crop seed, there may be huge economic opportunities for certain businesses. Same for, you know, our drainage water management, wetlands, and bioreactors. I look at these four, and it takes uh, land improvement contractors, drainage contractors, to do a lot of that work. So there's economic opportunity for, for them as well. There was a question over here. The, like the agribusiness of Iowa certified crop advisors that's a great question and I think the uh, some discussions I've had um, with the agribusiness of Iowa the AAI um, they're very involved and engaged and some of the co-ops are more engaged around here Heartland co-op um, they've they've really taken this to heart what they can do with their with their agronomists to try to you know look at getting some of these practices implemented. I think it's going to take time, but it seems like there's, you know, they've been involved with the, a lot of the discussion that they need to be, you know, if we look at the farm and rural life poll that, that Dr. J. Arbuckle uh, leads, and you look at where do farmers uh, get their information about nutrient management, about, I think it was about 75% said from the, the ag retailer. Okay, so if we're going to make gains in some of these uh, nitrogen management uh, factors, they're going to have to be engaged with that. And, and it